Hey, welcome back everybody. Today I'm gonna do something that I've wanted to do for a long time. I, I actually did a video on this subject, I don't know, four or five years ago, but it wasn't as extensive as I wanted it to be and the video quality wasn't really the greatest. So I wanna redo this and the topic today is gonna be how to select the proper camshaft for your in. So I got on the internet and YouTube and I thought, you know, there's gotta be somebody out there that has a video or an explanation of how to select the proper camshaft for your engine. And I sifted through a whole bunch of YouTube videos on that topic and to be honest with you, there's really nothing out there. Uh, there's a lot of videos where the guys are talking about, well, you know, you got, Three, you got stages of camshafts, you know, if you want a street car, you need a mild cam with, you know, lower duration and lower lift. And if you want, you know, something middle of the road, you need a more radical cam. But if you're gonna race, you need a really big cam. And basically they split the camshaft categories up into four or five different categories of cams that you can choose from. But the reality is, when it comes to your particular engine, those videos are really basically useless. They don't really tell you, <clears throat> you know, so for my specific engine, my cylinder heads, my compression ratio, my, you know, engine that I'm putting in my car, what camshaft should I choose? What cam should I actually pick for that car? Now, there is some truth to the fact that you have to you have to decide what you want. Do you want high RPM power? Are you gonna be you know, pounding this thing all the time at the drag strip or whatever? Or is it a daily driver? I get, I, I get a kick out of people that say, oh, well, you know, man, I got a street strip car. No, you don't. I got news for you. There's no such thing as a street strip car. It's either a strip car or it's a street car. Well, you know, I call it a street strip car because I drive it on the street but I like to take it to the drag strip too. Okay, that's a street car. That's not a street strip car. That's a street car that you like to take out and drag race once in a while. A true strip car is not something that's really very drivable on the street. It's not friendly to stop and go driving or driving in traffic or, it's, it's just not, it's not streetable. At least it's, if you do try to drive it on the street, it's kind of a miserable experience but it's because it's designed basically for drag racing. And then of course we have the endurance uh, class of racing, like road racing and off-road racing. And I understand, you know, the, the big the big issue with those valve trains and cams is really durability and longevity and good power at the same time. So there are those categories out there. But again, what about my engine? You know, I look in the in the catalog for camshafts and there's pages and pages and pages of camshafts for my particular engine. Look and and of course I'm really we're talking about the bigger V8s here. That's kind of what we specialize in. That's kind of what I work on. There are other factors out there when you get into the imports and stuff, but we're not going to deal with that. We're we're going to we're going to deal with basically you're building a domestic v8 engine with two valves and push rods and an overhead valve engine so there are several things that you need to think about so the first question that we get a lot is hey man what lift cam should i be running in my engine what lift should i get there is a very specific way to pinpoint the lift of your cam the lift of your cam depends on how well your heads flow. Okay, so let me explain that. So the cylinder head has a valve that opens and closes. We understand that, right? We'll put this valve in here, right? And the valve is gonna lift to a certain point. So when I talk about the camshaft's lift, what I'm talking about is how far does that valve open? When that rocker arm pushes that valve down, how far far does it open? Different camshaft load profiles have different lifts. You can get a bigger lift cam that actually opens that valve further. Or you can get a smaller lift cam that doesn't open the valve as far. So there are just a myriad of cams available in different lifts for your specific engine. Whether it's a small block Chevy, big block Chevy, Ford, whatever. But how do I know what lift cam I should have? Well, there's a very easy way to know that. And what we have to do is we have to look at the head flow. In other words, how does your cylinder head flow? If I put that cylinder head on a flow bench, how much air or how many CFMs of air flow through that port at a specific lift point? 
Okay, so what I've done here is I have put some flow numbers on this on this board behind me now. Now here's the thing. This is basically how we do it. We put the cylinder head on a flow bench and I have other videos where we're flowing heads. And we're gonna flow air through that port and the flow bench has a Flowcom computer and what it does is it tells me how many CFMs or cubic feet of air per minute flow through that port. Now, we have we can do some simple math and basically calculate the horsepower potential of any cylinder head based on airflow because the bottom line is you guys an engine is nothing but an air pump that's what it does so we're going to flow the head now these are the flow numbers that we got off of a stock small block chevy crate engine this is just a low performance stock type valve stock port head this is not a good performing head it's designed for like a 230 240 horsepower crate motor okay so we're not talking about you know earth shattering numbers here but this is a good example of of just a stock type head so what we do is we open the valve to a hundred thousandths lift here we just open it slightly to a hundred thousandths and we let air flow through there, right? And we document how much air flow. Then we open it to 200, then we go to 300, then we go to 400, then we go to 500. We open this valve and as we're opening it to these lift points, we're measuring how much air is flowing through that port into the engine, right? So that's pretty easy to understand. So now we have to look at these flow numbers because the flow numbers are, are very revealing as to the characteristics of the head and also as to what lift cam I should have. So, if we take a look at these numbers, we started at 100 thousandths, we got, on the intake, we got 56 CFMs, okay? We go from one to two, and we, we just about double the amount of air going in by moving that valve 100 thousandths. That's good flow increase. So that port has really good flow characteristics at that lift point. We go to 300 and instead of doubling we go up about half that much. We go to two, from 2 to 3 again we have a really good gain. We gain we almost go 50 CFMs up right so from 1 to 300 thousandths this head has really good flow characteristics really high velocity air. We're getting a good increase by moving that valve. When we go to 400 thousandths lift, that's where things start to go downhill with this particular head. So we go from 158 to 172. That is only about 14 CFMs increase in flow, and I'm pushing the valve 100 thousandths. Here I'm pushing the valve 100 thousandths, and I got like 50 CFM gain from here to here and here to here. From three to four, we gained about 14-ish or so CFMs. Yeah, so what's happening is the further that I open that valve, the port starts to get maxed out. The amount of air that that port is capable of flowing starts to diminish because it's, it's only because of the size and the, and, the, and the shape of the port and the amount of air that's able to flow through a given space is going to diminish the further I open the valve. We go from four to 500, right? And we gain about nine CFMs. Not really very much gain. Now, when we go to five, from five to 600, that's where things go south really fast. So a cylinder head port gets to a point in the flow or in the amount of lift range where it becomes what we call saturated with air. When a port becomes saturated, that means that it is maxed out. It can't, no matter how far I continue to open that valve, it cannot flow any more air. In fact, if I continue to open the valve, what happens is you'll see the numbers reverse like we have here, and the port goes into what we call reversion. Saturation is when the, the, the port is maxed out, and if I continue to open the valve, my flow numbers are actually going to reverse. They're going to go into reversion and I'm going to start losing flow. 
Well, here's the problem with that, you guys. Now, a lot of times what will happen is somebody will have a set of heads like this, and they'll go down you know, to the local hot rod shop, and they'll see all these cams, right? And, and the cams have flames on the box, and it says high performance. You know, and another thing you hear a lot is, you know, you talk to customers or people about, hey man, what kind of, you know, what are you, what are you thinking about for camshaft? And their only response to that is, oh, I just, something, I just want something that sounds cool. I like that old school rough idle. And then you start talking to them about, well, you know, we kind of need to match the cam to the engine if you want it to perform well. And they're like, oh, and they don't even know what you're talking about, right? Because there's so much like, misconception and disinformation around camshafts right and the whole idea is like well you know I got this big lift cam you know the bigger the better right well the reality is is that bigger is definitely not better especially if you have a low performance head it's actually gonna hurt your performance one of the things that we have to take into consideration is the valve springs now this is just an inner spring from a dual set most of the valve springs are bigger than this, but you get the idea. This is a valve spring, so the rocker is actuating that valve spring. So I want you to think about this for a second, because this is where we really start to think about why lift is important and why the lift needs to match our heads. The valve springs exert pressure on the valve train, or in other words, camshafts don't make their own power. They are driven by the crankshaft with a chain or a belt or a set of gears or whatever, right? So the camshaft is driven by the crank. The crankshaft has to overcome the resistance that the cam is putting on it. So in other words, the cam is a parasitic draw. It takes horsepower to actuate the cams. It also takes horsepower to compress these springs. Now if I have a spring pressure right up here in this range, about four or 500 lift, of about 300 pounds per spring, which is pretty average for like a, uh, a flat tappet cam with like a Z28 spring or something. The big rollers have much more pressure. But the point is, let's just say hypothetically I have 300 pounds of pressure on this spring in this area right here, right? And I go out and I say, well, you know, I bought like a 620 lift cam for this motor, right? So my lift is 620. I'm way down here. Here's the point that you have to get. When it comes to lift, I need to look at my flow numbers and say, gosh, where does my head flow the best? With this cam right here, if this was me, I would be putting about a 450 lift cam in this engine. And here's why. If I use horsepower to actuate the spring, right I'm actuating that spring with the horsepower all of the rocker motion from about 450 all the way to 620 right here which is where you your, your new lift is I'm using engine horsepower to actuate those springs but my airflow is reversing so I have this big parasitic draw on the crank I'm using all this horsepower to, to, to actuate these but I'm getting no flow into the head. And what happens is, when you take a cylinder head that flows like this, like a stop type head, and you put a big giant big lift cam in it, what happens is you actually end up with an engine that's kind of sluggish. You will actually lose power. So when, you, when they say, oh, bigger is always better, that is absolutely not true with camshafts. The camshaft lift actually needs to be matched to the flow characteristics of your head. Now, if you have a cylinder head, like an aftermarket dart or AFR or something, that flows to 620, 700 lift or whatever, no problem. Put that big radical cam in there, right? And you will have, right, a lift that matches the flow of your head. What's crazy about these heads here, this is a stock crate motor head. GM puts a cam in this engine from the manufacturer that's about 420 lift. So the lift is about right there, right? You could probably get away with 500 on this if you really wanted to and it would probably be okay. 
But even at that, you're going from 400 to 500, and you're only gaining, you're, you're gaining, you know, eight or nine CFMs. So you're actuating all of the force on that spring. If you multiply, let's say you have 300 pounds of spring pressure and you have 16 springs. If you multiply 300 times 16, that ends up being a lot of spring pressure. And I'm coming up here and I'm getting no airflow into the engine. My airflow has diminished, but my pressure that is being exerted on the crank is increasing because of my lift and my valve spring tension. So for optimal power when it comes to lift, you have to know what the flow of your heads is. You have to know where they flow. Now, if you want to run a bigger cam and you want it to the, the, the lift to be optimal, you need better heads. That's all there is to it. You just need to get a better flowing head that flows up here. Stock type heads don't do well with big camshafts. They just don't run good because of this issue. So lift, hopefully you get this, lift is dependent on your heads. If you call Comp Cam's tech line and you say, hey, what lift cam should I run? One of the first, I gotta hand it to those guys at Comp Cam's, the first question I'm gonna ask you is what heads are you running and what are the flow numbers? I've had them ask me that. I've, I called them out of curiosity and they asked me that. But unfortunately, they haven't put out a good video that tells anybody about this. Okay, so I don't know why this is all a big secret. You know, it shouldn't be. So you should be able to, you know, the average guy out there that's building his motor, you should be able to get online, look at camshafts, understand your flow numbers, and kind of figure out in the ballpark where your lift should be. Okay, so that's lift in a nutshell that's really the factor is flow now the next spec that we always look at is duration now duration is a different spec and the determining factor in duration is going to be what rpm range do you want to make your power in now there's a lot of factors that go along with this you, you, with a big duration cam the bigger the duration now, now let's define what duration is. Duration is, so if I say, hey, what's the duration of this video today? You know, it'd be like, you know, 30 minutes. So duration is a period of time. Duration is how long the valve stays open. From the time it opens, leaves the seat, fully extends, and then closes again. During that event, from open to close, how much time transpired. Now we can't use time on the clock like seconds or minutes or milliseconds because the engine runs at a varying RPM. So we have to use something that's gonna be constant. So what we use to time the duration is we use crankshaft degrees. So in other words, duration is this, you guys. How many degrees did my crankshaft rotate while the valve was open from this point, opening to closing, how many degrees went by? How many degrees did the crankshaft turn? Now, the more degrees the crankshaft turns, the bigger your duration, obviously. So the bigger the low profile, it's gonna open the valve sooner, it's gonna hold it open longer, and it's gonna open it later. Big durations cam cams will do that. Now, the bigger your duration, or the longer the valve stays open, the bigger effect it has on RPM range or power output. So big duration cams, as a general rule, are gonna move the power band up slightly. So what you'll see in the book is you'll see, you'll see uh, durations around 250, 260 for a stock cam. That, that, that means, and this is advertised duration, we also have actual duration, which is actually a better judge of power up. But, but we're just gonna, for intents and purposes, I'm gonna use the big advertised numbers. Right? This is what the cam manufacturer says. This is our advertised duration. And they like it because it's, it's a bigger number. So with an advertised duration around 250 or 260, that's pretty much a stock cam. That's going to have, and, and what they'll tell you is this camshaft has an RPM operating range with this duration of 1500 to 5500. Right? And they'll say it has a smooth idle. It's for good low end torque. Right, so from 1500 up, it's got real good power all the way through that range. But when you get to 5,055, it's done. You're, you're not going to make any power above that. Then we bump up, and, and it, the book will say, well, this camshaft has a duration of you know 270 to 280, somewhere in there, advertised duration. And it'll say, this has an RPM operating range from about you know 2300 up to 6500. 
And again, these are, these are hypothetical numbers, but they're pretty close to what you'll see. Then you get into the real radical cams, and, and, it, and also where it says idle, it'll say fair, right? It has a little bit of a lopy idle, but it's you know, still streetable. Then you get up into 290, 300 duration, somewhere in there, advertised duration, and it'll say this has an operating range from 3,500 to 8,500, right? And it has a very rough idle. So, and there's a bunch of cams in between all those, but those are just the three like averages or extremes. Well, you have to figure out what operating, RPM operating range you want your engine to be in. Now there's a couple of factors that you gotta think about. Number one, do you wanna be running around town you know, at 7,000 RPMs everywhere you go? You know, maybe you do, I don't know. You know, maybe that's what you're building. But for the most part on the street, most of your power is gonna be in the mid to low RPM range. You know, if you're building a race car, then that changes everything. So the duration really just depends on what RPM range you plan on making your power in. Now, when you get into big duration cams, there's a lot of stuff that you have to consider. Number one, if you have an automatic transmission, you have to put a higher stall speed converter in. In fact, they'll even tell you in, in the cam book, you know, you get to a certain level and they say, this is the biggest cam you can run with a stock converter. And then they go to the next cam up with bigger duration. They'll say, you have to have a, a high stall speed converter because what happens with a stock type torque converter and automatic, if you get the duration too big, you get that rough idle. When you get to, to, to the stoplight in traffic, the car will start to surge, right? So you'll come up on the converter and the car, you'll, you, the car will just be, it'll be surging. You know, if, you, if a car is surging at a stoplight, your cam is too big for the stall speed of your converter. You need to step up to a bigger converter. So th there's a lot of stuff to consider when it comes to duration, but, but really what now you may say, oh man, I want to turn 8,000 RPMs. So the big question is, is your engine capable of turning 8,000 RPMs, right? And so we have something called piston speed, right? We, we calculate how fast the piston is moving. Now here's the thing, the longer the stroke of the crank, the faster the piston speed is gonna be at a given RPM. If you have a big cubic inch motor with a big long stroke, you're actually limited on how much RPMs you can turn um, and be safe right because the piston comes up to tdc and it stops changes direction goes down to bdc and it's and it and it stops and changes direction so it's reciprocating it's going back and forth well the longer the stroke if i have a three inch stroke like in a 302 that's going to be a much slower piston speed at 8,000 rpms than a four and a half inch stroke like a big block stroker so you have to understand the longer the stroke of the engine, the faster the piston speed is going to be. Now at a certain piston speed, if I exceed a certain speed, right, the piston is going to go to bottom dead center where it's supposed to top, stop and change directions. It's not going to stop. It's going to keep going right out through your oil pan. So you have to consider, you know, the stroke of your engine. We have to consider piston speed. There's actually a really simple formula for figuring this out, and I'm gonna give it to you because I want to put the power in your hands. I want you guys to be able to build something and make educated guesses, right, as to what camshafts you, you should have. And if you, if you do this right, you should be able to get this pretty close. Okay, so here's the formula, guys, for piston speed. It's really simple. It's stroke, the stroke of your piston, whatever that is, multiplied by the RPM you want to run, whatever our RPM, you want to target RPM, you pick that, right? And we're going to do a couple here. And then we divide that by six, and that gives us piston speed, or the average piston speed in feet per minute. Now, the piston doesn't travel the same speed all the way up and down the board. It depends on the rod ratio, the length of the stroke, the length of the rod. Longer rods and shorter rods will change where that piston accelerates and slows down in the bore. There's a whole nother issue with, with rod length and rod ratio. And, and you know, a lot of guys used to make a big deal about the, 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 the length of the rod. Oh, you know, long rods are the best, you know. Well, 
I like long connecting rods mainly because it's easier on the piston. You don't have as much angularity and you got less side loading, but the reality is when it comes to power output, we've done a lot of tests with long rods and short rod motors, and honestly, the Dyna results, there's really not a lot of difference. We don't see much difference. There's guys that swear by long rods and say they make the engine makes way more torque and stuff. The reality is on the dyno, we haven't seen that. That hasn't actually played out in, in, in our experience. I like the longer rods because they're easier on the pistons and the rod bearings. But as far as power output goes, your rod ratio, yeah, it's uh, the, the difference is nominal. It doesn't really matter that much. So the stroke of the engine though, and the RPM has an, an effect on piston speed. So let's do a couple here. So let's say we have like a 302 Ford, like I said earlier, it has a three inch stroke. My target horsepower, it's like, hey man, I wanna turn 8,000 RPMs, okay? So I take my stroke and I multiply it by the RPM that I want, 8,000, that gives me 24,000. If I divide that by six, it's gonna give me my piston speed in feet per minute. How many feet per minute is that piston traveling? Now, with a modified engine, a street rod type motor, the general rule is you can go to about 4,500 feet per minute and be really safe. I back that off because I want my engines to be safe. I don't want to blow nothing up. I want to be, and I want longevity. I want this thing to live for a long time. So I say the maximum that I want to see with anything I'm building is I want my RPM range to be around 4,000 feet per minute, right? That's really safe, even for like a stock type engine. So if we look at the 302, we get at, at 8,000 RPMs, my piston speed is 4,000 feet per minute, which is really safe. So suffice it to say, you could put a duration, a, a, a cam that runs to 8,000 RPMs in a mildly built uh, 302 or three inch stroke motor and be really safe at that RPM. If the thing's a screamer, 327s were the same way. The 327 Chevy was a screamer is because the piston speed wasn't crazy high because of the short stroke. Now let's go to the other extreme. Let's do like a big 500 plus cubic inch stroker that has a four and a half inch stroke. Okay, let's do a big stroker. We want to twist that to 8,000. So four and a half inch stroke times 8,000 RPMs is 36,000 divided by six. That's 6,000 feet per minute. Wow. Okay, so there are engines that turn 6,000 feet per minute, but we're talking about really high end, super tricked out motors. And they usually have a pretty short life. This is like a high end race motor that gets rebuilt a lot, torn down a lot. For a street car or a street rod or something you're building that you want to live, you don't want to go to 6,000 feet per minute, trust me. So if you have this big stroker and you go out and you buy a camshaft that has, you know, 290, 300 duration or whatever, and it's, oh yeah, the RPM hard rating range is from 35 to 8,000. Well, that's not really very smart to do that because if you're twisting this thing up to 8,000, most likely that thing's going to have a real short life, right? Yes, it'll do it, but you are compromising the integrity of that engine by zinging those pistons that fast. It's gonna shorten the life of the pistons. So these are things that you have to consider. So when I'm picking a duration for a cam, I want a camshaft that is gonna put me around the 4,000 feet per minute. I want my camshaft duration to max out. I want my max RPM, so in this case, I don't want to turn this motor to 6,000. I'd probably turn it like to 58. I want a camshaft that's going to max out around 6,000 RPMs because above that, I'm just going to rip my motor to shreds. Again, if you build a hardcore all-out race motor, you can do it, but, but if you want longevity, I wouldn't go there. So the duration really is a factor in what RPM range you want your engine to run in and you really need to think about piston speed. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So we've covered lift and we've covered duration. Now, there's a couple other things that you have to consider with the camshaft. One of them is lobe separation. Now you'll see that on, the cam, on a cam, it says LSA or lobe separation angle. 
Lobe separation angle is not as big of a factor as it would be as lift and duration, but it, it is a thing. Here's what it is. Lobe separation, you have your camshaft here. It's the number of degrees between the center line of the intake lobe and the center line of the exhaust lobe. So this number of degrees here is your lobe separation. Tighter lobe separation is going to increase overlap, move your RPM range up higher into the RPM range, and it's going to make your idle rougher, right? Wider lobe separation, the lobes are going to separate right in here, and it's going to diminish the overlap, smooth out the idle, and lower the power band slightly. One of the one of the recommendations or one of the issues with lobe separation is when we get into computer controlled cars like OBD2 stuff that has fuel injection and computer control. When you see computer controlled cams, what you'll notice is, let's say I want a 280 duration cam, right? I want a cam that has 280 duration because that fits my, my RPM range needs, but I have a computer an OBD2 computer and the problem with that is when I get into a 280 duration cam with tighter lobe separation right like most street rod or hot rod cams that kind of have that rough idle what's going to happen is your OBD2 computer is going to go uh 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 boom check engine the computer's going to go I don't know what's wrong but the knock sensors are going nuts misfire 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 so it's going to tell you you got a misfire because it's going to interpret that rough idle as a knock. This is a problem that sometimes is very difficult to tune out. So what they do with computer controlled cams, they cheat a little bit. I, I can have a 280 duration cam, but if I take the lobe separation and I widen that out, that diminishes where these two cams, these lobes intersect, and it diminishes the overlap. So I could literally have a 280 duration cam with say 114 degrees of lobe separation and it's going to smooth out the idle. If that was around 106 or 104 lobe separation, right, like you can buy, it's going to have a very rough idle. So when it comes to manipulating uh, the, the idle quality, we can kind of play with that with lobe separation and that really comes into play when we talk about like LS motors with OBD2 computers and stuff. So, so that, that is also a big deal. So hopefully this helps you. This, hopefully this will give you some direction because you know, there, there, there's just nothing out there. Okay guys, so stay with me here. This, this is gonna get a little bit involved here and that's why I have my calculator. So let's go back to these flow numbers again and we need to talk about the different types of camshafts. So you'll see what they call single profile and dual profile cams. A single profile cam is defined as a camshaft that has exactly the same lift and duration on the intake lobe as it does on the exhaust lobe. They both have, you know, 520 lift and they both have, you know, 282 duration. The intake and exhaust are identical. Then we have dual profile cams. Dual profile cams are camshafts that have a different intake and exhaust profile. The intake has a different lift than the exhaust on the same cylinder, and the exhaust has a, uh, uh, the intake has a different duration, right? They have, they're, they're not the same. So how do I pick single or dual profile? This is another issue that we have to look at the flow numbers and we also have to look not only at the flow of the intake but we have to look at the exhaust. We have something called percentage of flow. So I put a couple of heads up here that we've actually flowed on the bench and these are the max flow numbers. The first head is a stock Chevrolet head. It's actually a Vortec, right? Which is, they're, they're, they're pretty decent, right? They're okay. The second one is the 427 big block Chevy heads that I put on my S10 427, okay? So the first example we have here is we have a, a maximum intake lift of 197 CFMs, or, or flow I should say, at 500 lift. And we have, at 500 lift, we have 128 CFMs of flow on the exhaust. Okay, this is typical of a stock Vortec head. Now, in order to get the percentage of flow, now, now just let me say this, when it comes to dual or single profile cams, we have to 
what's the determining factor whether or not I buy a, buy a dual or a single profile is actually the percentage of flow. Or in other words, percent of flow is this. What percentage of my intake flow is my exhaust flowing? Now, if we do the math on this, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take and we're gonna divide 197 into 128. We're, we're dividing backwards from what we normally do. We're gonna divide the larger number into the smaller because we want a percentage. Well, if we divide 197 into 128, our intake into our exhaust flow, we get 64% of flow. 64% of flow is not very good. That's very typical of a stock type engine. Some of the small block Ford heads were around 55% of flow. Okay, so 64% of flow. Now here's the general rule. If your head flows less than 75% of flow, right? 75% is the number we're looking for you need to get a dual profile cam and generally what we're going to have is we're going to have an exhaust lobe that has a little bigger lift and duration an exhaust lobe that has a bigger lift and duration is, is slightly is going to help compensate for that poor flowing exhaust port that that's the idea behind it so with this head here i would definitely want a dual profile cam i would want a camshaft that has uh, a little bigger lift and duration on the exhaust and, then, and when you see the numbers in the book you'll see yeah you know what do I get single profile do I want both intake and exhaust the same if it's below 64 percent of flow then no most stock heads most mild cams in fact if you look at look at a lot of the stock cams that come in the OEM engines they're almost always dual profile and they will beef up that exhaust spec a little bit to help that crappy poor flowing exhaust port especially if it's a small block Ford garbage Okay, so now let's look at the big block ported monster heads that are on this 427. They are flowing 338 CFMs on the intake and 307 CFMs on the exhaust. If we do the division there, we get 91% of flow. That's above 75% of flow, so we would definitely want a single profile cam, which is exactly what we put in there, right? And the camshaft that's in that engine has a 650-ish lift. You see where it flows to, 680? Yeah, well, from 650 to 680, it only went up about 10 CFMs. So we're comfortable with that 650 lift cam in that thing. Now, the other thing is, let's say you want a, I want a bigger cam, you know, I, I want more horsepower, I want something better, right? There is a way to figure out how much horsepower you can get potentially from these heads. Let's say I, I have these heads and like, man, the percent of flow is not very good. I'm not very happy with the horsepower that these are putting out. I want a better set of heads. I have a target horsepower number and I want to hit that, okay? There's a real simple way to do that. If you have the flow numbers, which we do here, uh, Superflow has been really good about giving us the correct math equations so that we can figure out what the horsepower potential of the head is. And we know that this math works because we do this math after we flow the head, we put the heads on the engine and we take it out to the dyno and the dyno numbers are within five or six horsepower almost every time. So this stuff works, I'm telling you. Okay, so what I do is I take my intake CFM. Now let's say we, f we flowed the heads at 28 inches, right? Now 28 inches is a flow rate that we set the bench for. The bench can be set for so we have a, on the old analog benches, we have a tube on the side of it and we turn the bench on and it will pull liquid up that tube based on how fast the, the, the motor speed in the bench is. If we turn the motor speed up, it pulls liquid higher up the tube. If we turn the motor speed down, it pulls less liquid. So the standard for the industry is we flow stuff at least for street rod, hot rod, uh, you know, non-professional type drag racing stuff, we flow it at 28 inches. In other words, when we flip that bench on, it's gonna pull liquid 28 inches up that tube. That's how fast the motor speed is. 28 inches is the industry standard. And the reason we use 28 inches across the board is because when I flow heads on the bench here, I wanna be able to compare them to a set of heads I'm looking at on the internet where the flow numbers are posted, and they will almost always say float at 28 inches. That way we can compare apples to apples. So we know from Superflow that 
a head that's flowed at 28 inches, which is the standard, that's how fast my speed is, that cylinder head is going to be able to produce potentially 0.26 horsepower per CFM. Okay? So intake CFM times 0.26 horsepower gives us what we call our total potential horsepower. That's the total potential horsepower. That's a number that these heads are capable of making. So it's really simple. If I take 197 and I multiply it by 0.26, let's see what we get here. Uh, 197 times 0.26 is 51.22 horsepower. We'll just say 51 horsepower. Well, you say, well, 51 horsepower, that's not very good. Remember, guys, that's one cylinder, right? So we got 51 horsepower per cylinder, uh, and we're going to say times 8, it's a V8, 409 horsepower. So these heads are capable, right, times 8 of 409 horsepower. Now, there's more to the equation. Let me tell you something. Those heads right there with those flow numbers wouldn't make 409 horsepower if you strapped a rocket to them and dropped them off a cliff, right? There's something missing from that. That's not the final number that we're going to get. What we have to do is we have to look at the percentage of flow, you guys, because everything that goes into that cylinder has to come out. Well, we're only flowing 64% of our intake here. So what we do is we take our 409 and we simply multiply it. We say times 64 uh, percent, 0.64. In my case, I have a percentage, so I say 64 percent equals 262 horsepower. Okay. What's crazy is uh, the 350 with the Vortec heads. If you put a good camshaft uh, and a set of flat top pistons in it you end up with about 260 horsepower. 200, you, 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 can, you can really beef them up, you can, you can put bigger valves in, you can, you can uh, do a lot of work to those heads and make them much more than that. But that's, that's a good baseline. That's really what they're capable of with that flow. And another thing, we're gonna increase the flow here a lot, right? So when we modify these heads, we put bigger valves in them, we do a little porting on the exhaust, we might get that up to 80%, and that's gonna make this number way over 325, 330 horsepower with Vortec heads. We do it all the time. But in stock form, eh, die, right? So now let's look at a real set of heads. So if we take our 338, now, now keep in mind, my goal with this S10 motor, this 427 with these heads, was 500 horsepower at the wheels. That's what I wanted, right? That was my target horsepower number. So, if we take 338 times 0.26, right? That's our intake flow. So 338 times 0.26 equals 87.8 or 88 horsepower, okay? So we're gonna say we have 88 horsepower per cylinder times eight, 88 times eight, 703 horsepower, but, Again, we got to work our percentage of flow. Now we have a high percentage of flow here. So if we take our total potential horsepower, which is 703, 703 times 91%, times 91%, we get 639 horsepower. That's our realistic horsepower that these heads will make. 639, right? 639 at the crankshaft. We're going to lose about 20% in the drivetrain. So if we take 639 and we multiply it by 20%, 639, that's 127 horsepower that we're going to lose. So 639 minus 127, 512 horsepower is what I realistically would get the wheels. My goal was 500. Now, this wasn't an accident. It's not like I said, well, guy, I want 500 at the wheels. I'm just going to grab all these parts and throw them together and see if it works. We ran all the numbers. We knew what we needed as far as head flow and camshaft selection and all that to go together to make this horsepower. So the thing is, if you want a target horsepower number, right, 
it, it's it, the bottom line you guys it's all based on head flow it really is the camshaft selection uh, it depends on on what head you have it also depends on the rpm range of the engine and so forth but these are really basic fundamental things that you need to know when you're looking for a camshaft it's not it's not just you know i want the most radical cam i can get because i like the cool sound yeah well i, I mean i'm not against a cool radical sounding cam i like the way they sound too but the reality is is that may not be the best choice for what you're doing so hopefully this makes sense i've 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 just been, you know, really perplexed lately. I've had a lot of people, they, they, they get on social media and they say, hey man, I got XYZ motor, what cam should I run? Well, and then you say, well, you know, what heads are you running? What's the flow numbers? They have no idea, right? Asking somebody what cam you should put in your motor based on the fact that you have a 350 or a 400 or whatever, that's like going to the doctor and say, hey doc, I got a pain here, what's wrong, right? Tell me, come on, come on, what, 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 what's wrong with me, you know? Well, he's gonna say, well, you know, either you got a pulled muscle or cancer, I'm not sure, right? So, you know, what's he have to do to tell you what's wrong with you? He's gotta do a bunch of investigation, right? He's gotta do blood tests, he's gonna examine, blah, blah. He's got all these tests, you know, and at the end of the day, he's like, yeah, you got a pulled muscle or whatever. Here's some, here's some muscle relaxers, you know, so, you know, there's some, it's the same thing with an engine. And, and the thing is, the thing that makes this so, so, right, difficult is every engine is different, right? Depending on the compression ratio, the size of the engine, the cylinder head design, the, the you know, the, the vehicle that it's in, there's all kinds of issues that go along with this that you have to consider. So hopefully this makes sense. If you have any questions, I hope I didn't make you even more confused than you were before you watched this video. But these are really some basic things that you have to kind of put into practice if you're gonna pick a camshaft that actually works. So I appreciate you watching. Uh, please support this channel, subscribe, like. Um, and if you have any questions, make sure you ask them below. And I will talk to you very soon. I promise I got a bunch more videos coming up. Got a Pontiac Stroker. Uh, got an LS1 coming, yes, finally. Uh, so uh, thanks for watching and stay tuned. I will see you soon.